What is malted barley and why do we make beer with it? Barley is a cereal grain like wheat, oats, and rye. It was one of the very first cereal grains cultivated by man. In fact, many anthropologists have theorized that it was the cultivation of barley and the subsequent production of bread and beer that led to permanent settlements and civilization in the ancient world. There are records of barley being cultivated and used for beer going back almost 10,000 years. We make beer with barley for the simple reason that this is what it has always been used for. It wasn't a question of can we make beer with this, but rather what can we do with this barley? Beer and bread were the answers. The barley kernel is also very hard and, unless you're a cow, you could break a tooth trying to eat it raw. At some point in history, 10,000 years ago or so, someone figured out that if you soak it in water, it will start to germinate and get softer. Now, if you have ever taken a biology class in school, you will know that sugar is the basic source of energy for all life on Earth, both plant and animal. In a seed, this sugar is stored in the form of starch, which is simply a long chain of sugar molecules. When a seed germinates, natural enzymes in the seed break these starch molecules into sugar molecules that the growing plant can use for energy. This is where the sugars come from that we ferment into beer. Physically extracting those sugars is the tricky part, and this is where the malting and mashing processes come into play. A maltster steeps the barley in water to begin the germination process to release the enzymes that will break down the kernel and release the starches. These starches are contained within plant cells within the kernel. Perhaps a better way to visualize this is to imagine a wooden crate filled with small cardboard boxes, each containing several plastic bags of candy. The wooden crate is the barley hull, the cardboard boxes are the plant cell walls, and the plastic bags are a protein matrix that holds the starch granules. There are different groups of enzymes that break down these various barriers, the three principal groups being the gluconases, the proteases, and the amylases. During malting, the majority of work is done by the gluconases breaking down the cell walls and the proteases breaking down the protein matrix to make the starch more accessible. The degree of breakdown is called modification, and a fully modified malt is soft and crumbly, or friable, meaning that it crushes easily. When the malt has germinated just enough to where the kernel is fully modified, the maltster dries the malt to stop the germination, leaving the starches ready for the brewer. Over-germinated kernels are called sprouts, or plants. Mashing is the continuation of the malting process a few weeks, months, or even years later. The idea is that the brewer can store the malt until he is ready to use it, and then restart the enzyme processes, finish extracting the starches, and converting them into sugars. To do this, the malt has to be rehydrated to reactivate the enzymes. The brewer crushes the malt into small bits to rehydrate it faster, and he or she does this with hot water so that the enzymes work faster as well. Each enzyme group has its own preferred temperature range where they work the best. Temperatures exceeding that range will denature the enzyme or change its shape, and it won't work anymore. Enzymes are like tooling jigs in this respect. A protein or starch molecule fits into the enzyme jig, which cuts it in a specific place, creating smaller proteins, or in the case of starches, creating sugars. Therefore, the mashing process consists of crushing the malted barley into grist and soaking that grist in hot water for an hour to allow the amylase enzymes to convert the starches into sugars. This sugar water, or wort, is then drawn off and boiled with hops. Malting prepares the barley for the mash, and mashing the malted barley is how we make the wort. There are two classes of malts, base malt and specialty malt. Base malt is, quite literally, the basis of the beer. Base malt is 75% or more of a beer recipe by weight. Specialty malts are malts that have been kilned, stewed, toasted, or roasted to provide extra flavors. Generally, specialty malts only account for 10 to 20% of the recipe. 
Base malts provide most of the fermentable sugars that the yeast consume and turn into alcohol and carbon dioxide. Base malt essentially tastes like white bread. Specialty malts generally do not provide fermentable sugars, but instead provide some unfermentable sugars and lots of flavor. Specialty malts can be added to a beer recipe to add richer, maltier flavors such as bread crust, toastier flavors such as cookies or biscuits, sweeter flavors like honey or caramel, and roasted flavors like cocoa or coffee. Base malts need to be mashed at 150 to 155 degrees Fahrenheit or 65 to 67 degrees Celsius for one hour to convert their starches into extractable and fermentable sugars. Specialty malts have already had their starches converted into unfermentable sugars and other flavor compounds by kilning and roasting after the malting process and don't need to be mashed. They can be steeped in hot or cold water, like tea, to extract their flavors. Usually, they are simply included in the mash, but they can also be steeped separately. And then there are the non-malt sources of starch or fermentable sugars that can be added to the recipe, and these are called adjuncts. Starch adjuncts, like flaked oats, rice, and corn, can be added to the mash where the barley enzymes will convert these starches into fermentable sugars. Sugar adjuncts can be added directly to the boil to contribute their characters to the beer. Some examples of sugar adjuncts are honey, table sugar, and syrups. In general, a typical beer recipe will consist of a base malt, such as Pilsner malt, Pale Ale malt, or Munich malt, and one or two specialty malts, such as caramel malt or a roast malt. Caramel malts are described by their color, 20, 40, 60, 80, or 120 lova bond, which ranges from gold to deep red brown, and they have flavors ranging by color from honey to caramel to toasted marshmallow or burnt sugar. Roasted malts are darker, from brown to dark brown to black, with flavors ranging from burnt toast to bitter chocolate or cocoa to coffee. As I mentioned earlier, beer recipes are like sandwich recipes. The base malt is the bread, and the specialty malts are the meat, cheese, pickles, and tomato. A good sandwich recipe has the right proportions so that one flavor doesn't totally dominate the others, and the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. The same logic applies to beer recipes. A good beer recipe needs balance between sweet and bitter, malty and hoppy. Hops do not come from rabbits. I want to make that clear from the beginning. Hops are the pine cone shaped flowers of the female hop plant, Humulus lupus. No, I did not make that up. You can see why I wanted to clarify the rabbit thing, because this sounds even sillier. Hop cones grow on vines that can reach 30 feet high or more. The hop cones look like pine cones, but are light green, thin, and papery. At the base of the bracts are the golden lupulin glands that contain the essential resins and oils that are so prized by brewers for their bittering and aroma qualities. The hop oils and resins also inhibit bacterial growth, and this natural preservative property is one of the reasons hops were first used in beer, and they have been cultivated for use in beer for the past thousand years or so. Hops typically contain 3 to 18 percent by weight of alpha acid resins and 2 to 4 percent by weight of essential oils. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were only a couple dozen varieties, but today there are hundreds as brewers and growers look for better agronomy and new flavors and aromas. Hop aromas and flavors vary by variety, but in general they can be described as a mix of floral, fruity, citrus, vegetal, herbal, resinous, and spicy characters. In recent years, development efforts have focused on enhancing the fruity character of hops, as well as increasing the alpha acid and oil percentages. Bitterness is contributed by isomerizing the alpha acids from the heat of the boil. Isomerizing in this case means to change the molecular structure to make the resins more water soluble. Hop additions to the boil are specified by weight, variety, alpha acid percentage, and boil time. For example, one ounce, or 28 grams, of Cascade at 7% alpha acids boiled for 60 minutes. Hop boiling times are always stated with respect to the end of the boil when the heat is turned off. 60 minutes, 30 minutes, 
for 15 minutes before the end of the boil. Basically, the longer you boil the hops, the more the alpha acids will be isomerized, contributing more bitterness to the wort. However, there is a trade-off between bitterness and the flavor and aroma. While the alpha acids become more bitter with longer boiling times, the hop oils are boiled away. Therefore, long boiling times, such as one hour, are said to only contribute bitterness, but no flavor and aroma. Shorter boiling times are said to contribute some bitterness and retain some flavor and aroma, while steeping in hot wort, not boiling, will contribute small amounts of bitterness and retain lots of hop flavor and aroma. Cold steeping of hops, otherwise known as dry hopping, retains the most oil and is the preferred method for gaining lots of hop aroma in the beer. Dry hopping is usually done either in the fermenter or serving cask. Hops typically come in one of two forms, either whole cones or pelletized. The pelletized hops are more compact, easier to measure, and store better than the cone hops, which are typically stored as bales. Pelletized hops look like rabbit food, but they have nothing to do with rabbits. There are two main types of beer yeast, ale and lager. These two types of yeast differ in small ways, but the most important difference is the fermentation temperature they work best at. Ale yeast work best at temperatures of 65 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, or 18 to 21 degrees Celsius. Lager yeast produce less fruity esters than ale yeast and work best at 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit, or 10 to 13 degrees Celsius. There are hundreds of individual strains of ale and lager yeast, and there are different groups of strains that are more similar to each other than they are to other groups. In fact, a good analogy is to say that the world of yeast is every bit as varied as the world of dogs, where you have different breeds or strains that have particular characteristics, but even within a breed or strain, there are different cultivars that will be slightly but noticeably different from each other. All beer yeasts consume simple sugars and produce carbon dioxide and alcohol. They also produce a lot of other flavor compounds, such as fruity esters and spicy phenols. In general, the warmer the fermentation, the more esters and phenols will be produced, depending on the particular strain. Yeast packages come in two forms, dry and liquid. Dry yeast packages are similar to the bread yeast packages that you buy in the grocery store, but those are bread strains and they do not make good beer. Dry beer yeast are select strains that have been manufactured to be nutrient rich and generally require less wort aeration than liquid yeast packages. We will discuss wort aeration more later. Dry yeast packages have a longer shelf life than liquid yeast packages, years versus months, but there is a greater variety of liquid yeast strains than there is of dry. For example, a yeast company might market five different British ale strains in liquid form, but only one British strain in the dry form. Let's talk about yeast pitching rates. This is the second priority for brewing good beer, pitching a sufficient amount of fresh, healthy yeast. In general, all yeast packages contain a similar number of cells, generally about 100 billion, although it can vary by manufacturer. Generally speaking, one yeast package is more than sufficient for any two and a half gallon or 10 liter batch of beer. If it's a very strong beer, like a barley wine, then two packages may be necessary. Fresh liquid yeast looks white or ivory in color. Old yeast looks brown, like peanut butter. Dry yeast always looks beige until it has had a chance to rehydrate. The final ingredient is water. The water is important because it is 90% or more of the beer. The water should be clean without any off odors or off flavors. Almost any water source will work as long as it's clean. At this stage in your brewing education, we are not going to dive into water salts and water adjustment. For now, I have only one recommendation, and that is to use either carbon filtered tap water or to use bottled water. The reason is that you want to avoid the chlorine that is used for residual disinfection in most cities. Chlorine will react to form medicinal flavors in the beer. So if you have carbon filters on your faucet, you can use that, but otherwise, I recommend that you go buy three or four gallons of bottled water for this first batch. This concludes our discussion of the ingredients that are used to make beer. 
However, this is probably a good time to talk about malt extract beer kits. Malt extract is simply a dehydrated wort. Basically, the mash has been done for you, and all you have to do is dissolve the extract in three gallons of water and begin the boil. Malt extract beer kits, like the one shown here, contain the malt extract, hops, yeast, and instructions to make a full batch of beer. Malt extract beer kits are widely available at your local home brewing supply shop or online, with many different styles and recipes to choose from.